Hello. In this first module in Cinema 107, we'll be focusing on the elements of photography, Lee and song, and movement in film corresponding to chapters 1, 2, and 3 in your Understanding Movies textbook. Focusing on photography, you should understand that filmmaking is a relatively recent art form spanning just over 120 years. As an art form, its evolution was virtually explosive and accelerated at a speed incomparable to the other arts because of its inherent dependency on technology. As a child of the modern age and in this technological age, film has kept pace with the technological advents constantly emerging and expanding. In considering photography in general, and the camera in particular, technology and the camera have evolved at an exponential rate as compared to those technologies required by other art forms in the past. Since the beginning of moving pictures, the camera has evolved to the point that it can see better, record more, explore the deepest recesses, witness the birth of stars, cosmic and artistic, create imagined realities or probe our very veins and bring to light what was beyond human vision. However, this tool for recording, for storytelling, in and of itself is a lifeless instrument unless there's an artistic visionary behind its use and application, a great cinematographer. Regardless of a film's brilliant screenwriter, inspired director, and awesome actors, what matters in the end is the image on the screen. Cinematography consists of manipulating photography so as to render a reality or a surreality or to stir up emotions of happiness, sadness, laughter, and fear. A, cin a cinematographer's job is to express the story of the screenwriter and the vision of the film director onto film. A cinematographer seeks to capture and reveal emotions, texture, psychology, milieu, etc., and form the space of film through choreographed camera work and lighting. Working together, the director, writer, lighting unit, and cinematographer make important decisions about the look and feel of a movie. Is it going to be shot in digital or film? Is it going to be in color or black and white? Will the colors be vivid or faded and dull? Is the camera going to be tied to a character? Is the film going to have a realistic tone or an expressionistic one? Is the photography manipulated, distorted, enhanced, modified by filters, lenses, or other means? In a film like Citizen Kane, various photographic techniques and styles are incorporated from formal to newsreel, expressionistic, handheld, etc., even manipulating the film stock itself to render it as archival footage. Or take, for example, in Bonnie and Clyde, a film you will be viewing. In it, there is a family reunion scene where a nylon stocking was put over the lens to create an arid, barren, and somber tone, in effect. It produced a more of a desiccated, funereal quality than a fecund and joyous reunion. Or in The Graduate, when Elaine is out of focus in a close-up while her mother, Mrs. Robinson, is down the hall in sharp focus, and with both in the same frame, as ben Benjamin, off-screen, is trying to reveal to Elaine that he has been having an affair with her mother, and as that idea is getting clear in Elaine's head, the focus shifts, slowly bur blurring the background with Mrs. Robinson and sharpening the focus on the tight shot of Elaine's face as the meaning of Benjamin's words become clear in her mind. The use of focus lets the audience know what is happening in Elaine's mind. As you view the movies in this course and beyond, pay some attention to the use of photography, the use of light and dark, the particular shots and angles, the use of color and the use of focus and lenses in rendering meaning and significance to the overall experience of the film. Likewise, the mise en scène. The arrangement of everything that appears in the framing, actors, lighting, decor, props, costume, is called mise en scène, a French term that means placing on the stage. In cinema, placing on the stage really means placing on the screen. And when the director is in charge of deciding what goes where, when, and how. In other words, if it's on the screen, and if it's a physical object recorded by the camera, then it's part of the mise en scène. The director works with set designers, prop masters, location managers, costume designers, and scenic artists to determine the look and feel intended. In some instances, the mise en scène is designed to evoke emotions that permeate the whole film. For example, in the German Expressionist film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, 
painted shadows and faces, impossibly distorted shapes, and a claustrophobic world without sunlight are implemented to unsettle the audience, render a world as seen through the eyes of a psychotic, and enhance the horror. A suburban sunroom, crowded with lush tropi tropical plants at night, serves as a jungle lair for the predatory cougar Mrs. Robinson, in an animal print outfit, no less, to pounce on the poor, lost lamb, Benjamin Braddock, in The Graduate. Likewise, the setting is an important visual element to the film. and includes all that the viewer sees, which informs time and space, apart from costuming. This aspect of mise en scene plays an extremely active role in film and periodically may assume as much importance in the total film as the action or the events. Drama on screen, for example, may not even require actors if swirling desert sand, wildly lashing palm fronds, or a falling autumn leaf dynamically contribute to the dramatic effect. Although setting provides a container for dramatic action, its significance goes beyond that and invites the filmmaker to control its various aspects artistically. Costumes can serve to enhance the narrative or story, for instance, by suggesting social position of characters. Obviously, a threadbare cotton shirt gives a very different picture than does a silk designer gown. Costume can imply, too, psychological disposition of characters. To the film director, lighting is more than illumination that enables the viewer to see the action. Lighting, like the other aspects of mise en scene, is a tool used by the director to convey special meaning about a character or the narrative to the viewer. Lighting can help define the setting of a scene or accentuate the behavior of the figures in the film. The quality of lighting in a scene can be achieved by manipulating the quality in the direction of the light. When the director manipulates the quality of the lighting or the relative intensity of the illumination, he can control the impact of the setting or the figure behavior, that is character behavior, has on the viewer and can emphasize the intended central focus of the frame. By using lighting that creates clearly defined shadows, the director can suggest a strong division between two spatial areas for a scene. For example, if the setting contains a definite area of shadow, it would be easy for the director to create a feeling of suspense by having one of the figures in the film move into the set shadows, as in Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. In this scene, not only does the mood of the setting become intense, but also the behavior of the figure, the characters, may seem exaggerated. Whereas hard lighting creates crisp edges around images and between spatial areas of the scene, soft lighting produces a diffused illumination. If the director is concerned with emphasizing a source of confusion for a character, or the lack of clarity of a particular element of the narrative, he will usually use lighting that tends to blur contours and textures of objects in order to stress the lack of contrast between two extremes, locations, or postures. In a scene from Strangers on a Train by Alfred Hitchcock, for example, two characters, one good and one evil, are portrayed in a scene in which the director has chosen to use stark bright and dark lighting for each respectively in the frame separated from each other as each is on one side of a gate facing each other. At one point, the hero moves around into the dark side of the gate next to the villain, suggesting that his move into the dark side of his mo uh, the, the mood of his dark side, the dark side is a part of his new motives and impulses. Hitchcock will use locations and lighting in this film to suggest these contrasts as well as when he cross-cuts, that is, edits of shots that switch from one location to another, when he cross-cuts from scenes of a bright outdoor tennis match being played by our hero to the dark recesses of a street gutter wherein the villain hopes to incriminate the hero. In this way, the director can gain a sense of a character's motives or psychology and about the relationships between good and evil and between characters and these opposite forces perhaps even within oneself. In summation, though each element of the mise en scene is combined with other elements of movie making to create a specific atmosphere in every film, and studying elements of mise en scene separately helps the viewer understand the function of each particular element, it is by focusing on the setting of a scene that the viewer can identify the exact importance of the time and place that he has shown, so that he can think about the scene in relationship to the proper historical or cultural context. 
Costume, like setting, helps the viewer understand the action of a scene in relation to a larger context. It also allows the director to develop important character traits in his characters. Concentrating on the behavior of the figures helps the viewer to understand the personal motivation of the individual characters. Careful observation of figure behavior also allows the viewer to understand the role of each character in relation to the development of the story. When attempting to understand the mood of a scene, the viewer should always remember to pay close attention to the lighting. Lighting can intensify or subdue a setting, but regardless of its effect, lighting is one more tool that the director uses to complete his cinematic statement. Therefore, lighting should be a vital concern to the student of film. By studying each of these elements as separate entities, the student of film can begin to understand the important role that the manipulation of the elements of mise en scene plays within the entire context of film. And by studying these elements as separate entities, the student of film can begin to appreciate the artistry required in filmmaking. In discussing movement, the camera moves in relation to something. Another way to think about movement, rather than as purely mechanical or moving of the camera itself as a means to capture image and action, etc., is the kinetic relationships between the camera and the elements it photographs. Movement in relation to the camera traditionally takes five forms. The camera moves in relationship to people. The camera moves in relation to the objects. People move in relation to the camera. People move in relation to each other and other objects in the frame. Framing elements move in relation to themselves or each other. The significance of each kind of movement is dependent both on the shot itself and on its context. For example, the aerial shot is probably most associated with epic actions or vast spaces, while a clear overhead shot might suggest a sense of fate or impending doom. So let's look at some of these. The camera moves in relation to people. Camera movement in relation to people can be thematically meaningful beyond simply following them around to let us in on the significant actions of the major characters. In His Girl Friday by Howard Hawks, the camera tracks ace reporter Hildy Johnson and her editor and ex-husband Walter Burns as they move through the hustle and bustle of a fast-paced city paper newsroom. We understand that the relationship between these two characters will be equally fast and furious. In Goodfellas, the camera tracks young mobster Henry Hill as he threads his way from the rear entrance to the kitchen and to his seat, meeting various characters along the way. Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music, we see the camera swoops from an aerial shot of a mountaintop to the twirling figure of Julie Andrews as Maria at the beginning of The Sound of Music to give us a sense of the expansiveness of her soul's desire and emotions in contrast to her cloistered existence at the nunnery. Cameras move not only with characters, but also move or switch point of view, as when we see through the eyes of one of the characters, known as subjective camera. One can see this use of subjective point of view, for example, in many horror films, where some of the camera movement is photographed from the point of view of monster or slasher, and we are seeing through the eyes and therefore are in the mind of, say, Michael Myers in the Halloween movies. In this example, the filmmaker wants to give us the disturbing feeling of identifying with the slasher, while at the same time feeling horror at their hour actions. Again, in a sequence from The Graduate, Benjamin Braddock slowly sinks and drifts aimlessly around the bottom of a blue swimming pool in, a new in the new diving equipment he doesn't really want. Earlier, we see a plastic scuba diver in his fish tank. We see his sense from his point of view. We see his existence from his point of view of suburban sterility, behind the scuba mask into a sterile, empty, artificially blue world. He becomes aware of his inner conflict with the plastic conformity of his surroundings and seems to be drifting and drowning in it. The camera can move in relation to things. Citizen Kane's camera seems always to be tracking in through windows and over fences to voyeuristically let us in on the private and secret life of its principal character. 
One of Spike Lee's signature shots is a camera seemingly to vertigenously circle around something in order to make his audience feel a sense of vertigo. People move in relation to the camera. Sometimes the camera is fixed, while the characters in the frame change their relationship to it. In Annie Hall, Albie Singer and his friend Max walk toward the camera on a New York street from some distance. We can barely distinguish them at first, but they get clearer as they approach the camera. In the meantime, we've been able to hear their conversation at precisely the same level, getting louder as they get closer. The photography establishes them and their interests as both idiosyncratic and typically urban. They blend into this street at the same time they are individuals. Characters also move in relationship to each other. Proximic patterns, that is, the distance between characters and the camera and each other, render significance and meaning to the relationships in terms of space. But it's worth noting that the movement between characters and things is also significant. When we watch the scenery go by from the point of view of the weekend canoers in Deliverance, we are struck with the beauty of the passing southern landscape. But when we see the canoe move from the point of view of the forest itself, their position seems fragile, the forest sinister. The boat moves so slowly they barely seem buoyed by the water, and we are not terribly surprised at the accidents toward which they are slowly drifting downstream. The framing of a picture can move. We usually call these different kinds of edits. The most straightforward examples of the changing frame are the old-fashioned iris in and iris out. That's the black frame mask around picture gets larger or smaller, making us concentrate on the single element within the frame the director wants us to notice. The melodramatic sight of a mother's hand ringing over the fate of her son. But various editing techniques are movements as well. There is the, the wipe, in which one picture lays over another from one side of the screen to another, as if being imprinted on the screen by a windshield wiper. There is the push, in which one picture pushes another picture off the screen in one direction. Or when there are multiple images within the frame, one can enlarge while the other reduces. A few films play with the idea of multiple frames on the one screen. For example, a split screen. And lastly, in regard to motion, sometimes no motion is good motion. Sometimes the camera is perfectly immobile to make a point. Directors sometimes keep the camera and actors perfectly immobile in a way of emphasizing thoughtfulness, indecision, mindlessness, or whatever other state of mind, and this tends to suggest a sense of contemporary inertia. We don't want to get too wonky and into the weeds with all the different kinds of photography and all the different kinds of mise-en-scene and all the different kinds of movement, but indeed, all of these components, these three elements, along with the others we will be studying, all work together to bring out the theme of a film, the effect of a film, and the power of a film. So enjoy your studies, and see you at the movies.